Hello, our lovely viewers, and welcome back to Marx's Think Tank. Myself, Chris, and Rich here. Hello, Rich. Hello, hello, Chris. So this week we're going to be talking about, very timely, uh, the Queen, and more broadly, the institution of the monarchy, I believe. Um, now, if anyone was waiting, originally this was meant to go out yesterday. Uh, you really... By serendipity, it's ended up today, which has happened to be King Charles's ascension to the throne. Uh, so it's kind of worked out quite well, I believe. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go through uh, some thoughts, a bit of history about the Queen and um, the sort of recent monarchy and its role in British society and its really its role shaping the world that we currently live in, whether that be positive or negative. I imagine the majority of our viewers will have come with answer preloaded and probably know what we're going to say as well but let's get there that's half of the fun uh rich do you want to do you want to kick us off and see what, what we've got yeah yeah um i mean it's quite a big thing we've got to cover here we're talking about um someone who refers to their family as the firm um you know you're talking about of course a queen a monarch a head of state uh, the head of 14 countries, actually, the head of state of 14 countries. So in her dying, uh, old Lizzie, Queen Elizabeth II dying, you've had 14 heads of state die, which, if you think about it, can never happen <laughs> in any other circumstance. Um, but I do, I just want to take a quote, you know, sort of from her opening speech, um, uh, one of her speeches, she said, you know, um, talking about her duties, she said to that, that the matriarch of our great imperial family of which we all belong. Okay, of course, now she's gone. Um, little, I mean, I've got loads of information here and statistics I've picked up, but when she took power in um, 52 uh, and obviously coronated in 53, she actually, um, uh, more than a quarter of the world's population was under her. Um, you know, the 700 million people were under the British crown in some oh. shape or form. So it's a huge... You know, it, 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 she was, um, as many people have described, the last imperial uh, yeah. sovereign. She oversaw the, the decline, you know, independence movements and stuff. And, you know, she's, what, 15 prime ministers, 14 U.S. presidents. So you have to remember that she's a contemporary of Truman and Churchill. Those are the two people that were in power when she came into power. So that's how far back you're talking when you're talking about which leaders uh she came in with and then also who she's been around since and uh, i mean people always reference that her coronation is the first color televised event mass color color televised event um you know she was the first person you know they started using email and radio and all sorts of stuff in her time so there's loads of things to cover i mean we're talking about yeah we are talking about an institution of the british empire uh, and then a family and a firm and all sorts of stuff. Um, one thing I think I will remember is um, the surname, Windsor. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's not really their surname. Uh, no. They changed it in 1917. Their real surname is Saxa Coburg Gotha or Gotha. I'm not really sure if probably Gotha. I don't know. My German's not great. Um, and I think that's quite an important point is that these guys, this fa family, the firm, are masters of PR. Um, yeah. The fact that they can get African people and African nations and nations that they form are colonized to have people that even like them there is because they're very good at PR. Um, the history kind of speaks for itself. I don't think we can cover all of the history. Um, but I think what I'd like to show you guys, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, Chris, is just to look at her coronation in 1952, that thing that was um, put into color and was broadcasted. I've got some stamps. We're not going to watch the whole thing, of course. Um, yeah. Is that good with you, Chris? Yeah, let's have a spin. All right, let's go for it. Uh, so I've put some nice little timestamps for us here. So one second. Um, yeah, here we go. So just double check that's fine. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So she is here riding in her carriage. So I'm going to start from this one here. Imagine if you can our young queen's feelings, as with her husband beside her, she is slowly born towards the hours-long ceremony of pomp, circumstance, and dedication, consecrating her as queen of all the nations and all the races over which she holds sovereignty. When did we stop speaking like that? <laughs> I think you're muted. 
Oh, sorry, I, I've muted myself. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but yes, when did we stop speaking like that? Right? <laughs> Our sovereign of all the races and names yeah. really, though. Yeah, uh, yeah ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so there you go. There's the the troops marching, um, you know, up and down the square. And the next thing, oops, sorry, let me put that back. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is just jump ahead to 520. So here she is um, accepting the uh, crown, she's being crowned, and just, just watch some of these bits and bobs. The first necessary step in the traditional ritual is that the Queen should be accepted by the people. The Archbishop of Canterbury addresses the congregation. Sirs, I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted Queen. Wherefore, all you who are come this day to do your homage and service, are you willing to do the same? The people have recognized their sovereign. The people. So, believe it or not, those are the English people, or the British people. They have recognized their sovereign. This room consisting entirely of um, bishops and priests and very few women and very few people of yeah. color the are queen, highly... The British people. society. <laughs> yes, yeah. These aristocrats. And, um, yeah, so these are the people, apparently. This is a part of the ceremony. This is what they believe. I'm trying to jump ahead to another little timestamp we have. The climax of the ceremony has arrived when the Archbishop gently sets this splendid emblem on the Queen's head. And the trumpet sounds. It's such a Any camp affair, around? isn't it? Like so it's, such pomp, a it's such a camp affair. So much pomp and ceremony. I, I get the need for for ritualistic sort of behaviour in in society. It, it's nice sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. the Americans have it to a much minimal affair. The the swear and of the oath, a swear to uphold the, the office of the presidency. But this with the mm -hmm. costumes, the peasantry, the trumpets. It just feels like something that it, it well it is completely out of time. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. These, so many of these traditions haven't really changed tremendously since at least Elizabethan, Edwardian, or even Georgian times. Some of them going mm -hmm. much further back than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It's it's just it's. Obviously, it's a way of social condition completely because people rely on them and they really, really get invested in these sort of things. Obviously, we, we've we seen that today. I don't know if you've tried to speak, saying anything remotely against what's going on today on social media, but the average uh, the average Joe really pushes back against you. People really mm. do. It's like attacking Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> right, 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 right. I, 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 yeah. I think actually on that question of, you know, criticizing uh, the queen versus criticizing uh, the firm or criticizing the image of the queen that we yeah. see. So uh, there's actually a good quote, which I'm going to find later when we bring up maybe a conversation about Africa and the colonies and what the response has been in Africa from Africans regarding whether yeah. they are allowed to criticize or, or how they feel about it. But yeah, I think there is a very clever um, sort of, again, PR thing here where if you criticize the queen, people are like, oh, you, you're just talking about a very nice old lady who, you know, was very polite and drank tea and, and all these things and, and, and said nice stuff and, and had lots of charities. And yeah. how dare you? So, yeah, but I think what I th what we should probably look at is also that she herself calls herself the firm and you're talking about something bigger than that. So I will say that we're not criticizing the nice lady that drinks tea. 
but no. we're taking a bigger picture of who she actually is and what she stands for as an institution. So that's quite an important yeah. point, yeah. I think. Yeah. So um, this is what we're looking at. I mean, this is this is the almost the ancient regime, if you want to use the French revolutionary term. Uh, yeah. What you're looking at, I mean, look at that. There's people in like white uh, dresses and, and sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, crown, yeah. everyone's got a crown and, and uh, I mean, they've only just changed their surname uh, 40 years before this. So they probably, I mean, I know that Victoria, a lot of them spoke German in the household too. They obviously phased yeah. that out in the 20th century, but. Um, Mainly due to, as you, you alluded to with, with the name change and the fact that it's yeah. PR, they are good at PR. And yes. the, one of the main reasons of that was because of obviously two world wars against Germans. It's not mm. sexy to be having a German royal family's name while you're getting mm. bombed by Germans. It was a complete yeah. practical decision. You see documentaries That's now true. saying the House of Windsor from this state to this state. I was like, well, they weren't called nope. the House of Windsor in this original day. Absolutely. They were Absolutely. And, and the German name <laughs> that I can't even begin yeah, to Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Saxa Gotha, something called Kobok. Saxa Gotha, Gotha, Gotha. A three barrel name, yeah. Um, but just on that one we just saw, it is, I mean, yes, traditions are always a bit strange, you know, there because it's an old practice, but it, it was bizarre. She puts the crown on, they then put their little crowns on, and then there's guys with little swords, and uh, it, it's almost childish uh, in a way. Childish. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll talk about that crown in a moment. So I'm just going to play the last bit now, and then we'll uh, have yeah. a bit of a chat about what we've just seen. So just as the last piece here. And so this day of days most memorable comes to an end. And with it begins a new era, the new Elizabethan age, an age in which the love and faith and hope of all the Commonwealth rest on the slim shoulders of the beautiful queen who has just been crowned. Long may she reign. Now, if we were to hear that commentary coming out of the mouth of the lady in pink news anchor in North Korea, they'd accuse her of being cultish. Literally, word for word, the, the fate and, and the happiness, security rests on this woman. <laughs> that is, that's cultish language, and that is intentionally so. <laughs> you, you're right. I mean, I've actually, I've been just reading some monarchists' uh, tweets and posts, and they say, well, you know, the monarch is a stable force, and it oversees, and it's duty, and, and also this expression, they are there to serve the people, and it is almost comical that how close this is to uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, state's yeah. language about serving the people and duty and uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, and you want to sit right that that uh, yeah. if you were to be the the <laughs> right, <laughs> you copy this in North Korea, they'd be like, "Oh, this is this is this is uh, this is bizarre." <laughs> People are waving flags and crying for a, a really uh, distant person that they've never met and never met will meet. And uh, well, what is this? Yeah. You know, meanwhile, look at this. It's it's almost identical. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean. That last line, though, long, uh, you know, may her, her reign, uh, may, may she reign forever long, whatever he, whatever yes. he said. Uh, quite, you know, um, considering that she was, yes, the longest reigning British uh, sovereign and the second reigning, longest reigning uh, sovereign ever. Uh, yes. the, the longest reigning Sorry. was, pardon? The, before that was Victoria, wasn't it? Uh, I, I don't know who, where she matches up. She's close. But for, for, for British, perhaps she's second. I just know that of all royals ever, uh, Louis the Fourteenth uh, beats her by um, two years. I think it's seventy-two years or something like that. Um, yeah. And another little tidbit is that that coach, the the massive gold state coach that they all ride around mm. in. Any guesses on how old that is, Chris? No, go on. Seventeen sixty-two. So it's uh, twenty-five odd years older than America. Um, that is how old that coach is. It's ancient. I was going to ask, do you, do you think, if, there, if it was a newer creation, I would have thought that it's probably not what it appears to be because it looks very much like a gold carriage, but I bet it's not. I bet it's just gilded I, I mean, gold. I, but would it be in yeah, that? Yeah, no, I don't think it's, it's not solid gold. I mean, that, that would be very royal if it was solid gold, but uh, it's, it's, it's actually not. not. very it's structurally sound. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. On soft metal. Yeah. Which gold isn't, yeah. isn't very good for anything, really. Other than... Right, right, right. But... Um, uh, apparently, though, this thing's really uncomfortable to ride in. So you actually have a number of almost like TripAdvisor reviews 
from different royals describing their experiences in uh, this uh, gold state coach. And uh, Queen Victoria described her uh, ride as uh, distressing oscillation. So, and yeah, apparently it's really crap. <laughs> like, um, Jeep seat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, I mean, the, the whole thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of that ceremony, really the, the part that stands out, the whole thing is it's about a crown, right? That's the, the big thing here. Yeah. And uh, I, I know that everyone's probably been reading in the news. What is this crown? Uh, what does it have? And people talking about these diamonds, stolen diamonds inside it. And to be honest, it's, it's, no, it's no mystery. It's not a conspiracy. Like they're not hiding where any of this comes from. If you go to the, um, I'll share the page here so we can all look at it. Uh, the, uh, the Tower of London's actual page, which which is where they are, the crown jewels are there, um, and you'll see that it yeah it's, it explains it pretty straightforward. This is what they are. This is where we got them. And uh, so the first one is, of course, the Saint Edward's crown, which was made in 1661. It's made of lots of gold. And so this is what the place in the head there. Yeah, so this one here, uh, so in this picture here, old Lizzie is wearing the imperial state crown, and she's holding the sovereign sceptre with cross and sovereign's orb. So this is the imperial state crown. Is it the same one? No, it's different to this one. It's the imperial state crown is this one. This is the imperial state crown. So she's wearing the latter. So there's a different one. So bear in mind, the crown jewels consist of a hundred objects and over 23,000 gemstones. So it's not just like the crown, that ball and the stick. It's a whole yeah. bunch of other stuff too. And um, this is only a small part of her actual material wealth. Like oh gosh. When we talk about the queen's yeah. money, a lot of it isn't, isn't cash money. It is, right. it's wrapped up in, in jewels, which defenders seem to act as that's an excuse. So I, Oh, they haven't really got the cash. It's in jewels. Well, we'll take jewels. We like, we're not picky. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, gold is. Oh no, it's not money. It's it's only gold. Yeah, oh, jewels. Okay, yeah. oh yeah. Okay. Well, well, then we can't do this. I mean, what could you? No one would ever exchange these things for money, of course. Yeah, we, probably, gold we can't break down jewels into cash. No, um, but yeah, actually, I've got. We have some uh, a good article about the um, the wealth and the land uh, that I've got. If you want to bring it up later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's her with the three big ones that we all know, the, the, the main crown, the orb, and the stick. So uh, let's not talk about St. Edward's crown. We'll just write that one off, It's even though it's, whatever, 400 years old. Right. Um, let's go straight to the uh, – let me just double check. Yes, of course, this one alone – yeah, here we go. The Imperial State Crown from 1937. So this one was uh, worn by King George VI uh, at, in 1937 when he was crowned, so that's – Elizabeth's dad, uh, the yep. guy with the speech yep. impediment, the guy from the King's Speech, um, the movie. Yep. Uh, replacing the one that Queen Victoria wore, wore which is a different one, uh, which I assume is the old one, the, the um, Edwardian one. Yeah, of course, her brother, saying. George's brother, was Edward, who abdicated. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's actually a good, good point. Famous uh, to see point. Mikhail and then he went to yeah. up with Hitler. And... But, yeah, he was Sorry, the one who. He was the one who went to buddy up with Hitler and very well in, a, in an alternate universe would have been some sort of fascist king for a Mosley-led government. Yeah, yeah. Th that's a very real alternative reality that could have happened. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's well documented that there was big sections of the British elite that were contemplating, at least contemplating, yeah. Um, yeah. some sort of deal like that with uh, with Mosley, with Hitler, with, with the fascists. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think that's well documented. Uh, I think that's, that is an important point to make, though, is that had uh, Edward kept on, um, Queen Elizabeth would never have been queen, ever. Um, yes. George would have taken over, and then, um, you know, had he not died, uh, maybe uh, things would have been different. But, well, actually, there would have been Edward's kids that would have taken on, yeah, not, not George. Would have been different Exactly, yeah. different bloodline. So it would be, yeah. So the only reason actually she stayed on for 70 years is because of Edward abdicating because he wanted to be with this American, um, you know, yeah. socialite. Yeah. Uh, George took over. George died quite young. And then, you know, she was left with the, the crown, the hot potato. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I think so it, a bit of an exception. 57, I believe, wasn't he, when he died? 
His age or the yeah, year? Sorry, he was, he was in, in his mid fifties. I think he was he was a quite heavy smoker. I think he, he died of yeah, cancer. I can't remember the age, but yeah, it was a, it was a it was a health. It was, a, it was smoking yeah. and poor poor lifestyle. I think yeah, but yeah, he did, he did die relatively young. Yeah, which is yeah why she why she took on. She was never she was not born to be the queen. She, she probably had had um, none of this happen. She probably would have just been one of the unknown royals that no one really cares or talks yeah. about. Just has a bunch of horses and then one the of the of are now. right exactly yeah 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 exactly um but yeah uh so if we talk about the imperial state crown uh so it has cullinan two as well as a bunch of other diamonds so this is the the diamond that's of interest cullinan two and cullinan one so these two come from a diamond that was mined in south africa in 1910 um and is the largest diamond ever mined and in the things that were cut from it were the, the largest diamond set. So um, there's one in, let me show you here. There you go. So if this you're looking down oval. here, what, what's that? Is this this big oval at the bottom? Yeah, so I believe the Imperial Secret, blah, 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 blah. Okay, this is the blue Stuart Sapphire, uh, which was smuggled out by James II when he fled in 1682 and adored the Imperial Secret. So it's not that one. Uh, this one is the Black Prince's Ruby, which is another massive stone uh, from Pedro the Cruel, King of Castile, before we get to Edward. Okay, so it's not that one. The Cruel. This is it here. This, this is it here. Yeah. The Cullinan II diamond is set in the front band of the Imperial State Crown. It's the second largest stone to be cut from the Cullinan diamond, the world's largest diamond. So there it is. Massive whopping piece of, uh, yeah, well. you actually look at the crown, it's not as perfect as you'd imagine it would be. Because obviously they wanted to keep the size of these crown, these jewels intact. But yes. you'd imagine that it would be quite a, a symmetrical. Well yeah. Designed. Yeah. Like that red one above it, it looks too big for what it's set into. But <laughs> yes, and the the pearls aren't exactly. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that's the best craftsmanship that's seen either. <laughs> Shoddy workmanship, I said. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually pretty, pretty rubbish. <laughs> yeah, that was that the best you can do? Come on. <laughs> okay. Um, then there's the sovereign, the sovereign scepter with cross. Okay, so this is where Cullinan one is, the bigger one, I guess. Um, and yeah, it was transformed in 1910 for George V by addition of the spectre from Cullinan one. Um, the Cullinan one was discovered in 1905. Sorry, correction, not 1910, um, uh, by Frederick Wells, the mine surface manager, was alerted to a shiny object and then you know took it out of the ground. But there are conflicting stories that it was actually one of the African workers who saw it first and then alerted him. But Nonetheless, uh, we'll have a conversation about that in a bit, about the land and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, this was the biggest diamond ever found on colonial land, uh, recently taken from African people, and apparently gifted it as a symbol of, for peace for Britain and South Africa following the wars. But there it is. That's the, the big diamond in the stick that, that we're all talking about, that we will probably see next year when we have Charles's coronation. Yes. Hmm. But yeah, uh, and one more. Uh, let's not talk about the orb. It's just a you know a giant piece of jewelry that's very old. This one here is actually quite inter interesting, and this is a different crown. So this jewel is called the Ko Koinur. Excuse my pronunciation, but uh, it's very famous because this one uh, is an Indian one. So right. apparently it comes right. from some southern India, and it was held by many previous owners, so Mughal emperors, Shahs of Iran, emirs of Afghanistan, and Sikhs. And oh, sorry, and, and Sikh Maharajas, and this one was taken by the East India Company. And if you want to read about you know proper plunder and yeah. theft yeah. and exploitation and all stuff, you need not look any further than looking into the history of the East India Company. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the Queen is happy to wear and carry um, many expensive, extremely expensive, probably arguably the most expensive jewelry in the world. Um, you know, as a part of her ceremony, yet uh, somehow. You know, takes these things and wears them without um, carrying the baggage or the blood um, that is clearly on the these jewels. Like you cannot really separate the the crimes uh, of of the of, of the British Empire from these jewels. They, they are literally from you know imperial sites and have an yeah, imperial. Yeah, these jewels represent quite quite well, trusty in all in all sense. Hmm. So with these jewels, obviously with what, everything that's been going on recently, it's all, you can't scroll through too far through social media without an article popping up of um, India now uh, renewing their 
request to have their jewels returned to them. And mm -hmm. I've, I've had this argument out in the past few days with people who the worst excuses for not returning them. One of the worst ones I've heard was that they're safe with us. We keep them protected. Which my reply was, so if I break into your house and steal your TV, as long as I promise yeah. to keep it safe, can I keep it? Yeah. It seems like the fact that hand and stolen goods is a crime in itself, separate to theft. Like, yeah. This, we know this is wrong. We, but the British yeah. Empire and the British Museum know that these things have been taken through nefarious means. They write it in placards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. There's no, uh, no it, reason over then we can't because the boss says no. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it, it, it's 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 an extremely awkward thing for the British Museum and the royal family to go on these trips to these countries and make speeches about history, and and then try and somehow not acknowledge or try and to sort of say, oh, yes, we acknowledge these things, but then maybe not apologizing. I think that's something that I wanted to read to you was a quote that from the Queen. So she she was one of the first, she was, yes, one of the first royals to visit Ireland um, for decades, obviously following the, the split mm -hmm. and the, the, the Civil War and all of the history. And um, there's a quote here she, she says at the banquet with uh, the Irish Prime Minister, which is obviously Irish Republic, not Northern Ireland. Um, she, says, she says, quote, to all those who have suffered as a consequence of our troubled past, I extend my deep thoughts and sincere th sympathy. With the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we wish would have been done differently or not at all. So, I mean, yes, it, it says deep sympathies and thoughts. And um, if only, you know, hindsight, oh, it's, it's so much it's better. But sorry. you don't really see like the... We're really sorry. I, I regret this, and I'm very sorry. I mean, there are instances where there have been apologies, but there is this almost seemingly unwillingness to directly apologize and directly, um, yeah. you know, confront their crimes. Uh, at least on some issues, I think on some they have apologized and whatnot. But but in, in that statement, I don't really feel like it. It feels like words play, words play, yeah. and wordsmith yeah. around the object, around the the, the 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 role, the role of your family. I feel like a lot of it is depending whether the benefits of those crimes are still benefits today. Like with yeah. Ireland, because it's not over, because Britain has still got the tippy toe in Northern Ireland, and it's still a hot topic issue, to apologise for anything related to the colonialisation of Ireland or any crimes of Britain in Ireland mm -hmm. would be seen as giving ammunition to Irish nationalists. Mm -hmm. Which... Mm -hmm. Mm. Which you would not be allowed to do. Mm. But we, we said to this, uh, we brought this up last week when we were talking about uh, Gorbachev um, with his speeches and how people are moved by speeches and they don't realise that speech writing is a job in itself and the people who read those speeches probably only got them the night before or sometimes even less. They weren't the ones who wrote them. And it goes go for the two for the Queen. The Queen doesn't physically sit down and write those speeches that so many grandmas cry over, these are written by professional writers. Mm, and mm, mm. what is included and not included is put or redacted with incredible deliberacy. Absolutely. absolutely. Except for, um, actually, yeah, there's two things I want to say to that. Except for Andrew. Uh, when when Andrew <laughs> got in front of the camera. But, uh, others. but uh, you, you're right, though. you're absolutely right, because... Uh, We've said this a number of times. Our PR, PR is their big thing. They're very good at, at pushing the image and, and changing yeah. and adapting yeah. and, and reinventing themselves. Um, so there were there's three good, really good articles that I found from the Guardian, and one is talking about how Buckingham Palace banned um, ethnic minorities from office roles um, back in the '60s. Um, yeah. But basically, any sort of royal household. Uh, they exempted themselves from ethnic uh, sort of discriminatory laws, so race and sex laws, where you couldn't not hire someone because they were black or Indian or um, or a woman or whatever. Um, so they exempted themselves from that. So that was a big story, and going along with uh, the whole Harry and M uh, Meghan story and Oprah and all that stuff too. Um, the royal household, the Queen, uh, quickly found a way of changing that narrative and sort of 
you know, reinventing themselves. So she got um, a an equerry, which I don't know what this role was, but it's a soldier that serves in her personal capacity in some way. And he's called Lieutenant Colonel Nana Tukwamasi Ankra. So obviously um, uh, a darker skinned guy, I assume, assume from Africa. I'm not really sure where he's from, but, um, you know, that was adopted in, the, in whatever, 2018 or 2019. Um, yeah. To sort of then yeah. counter the idea that they were racist and the idea that there was a problem with 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 racism in the household, um, so they're very good at, at at changing things when they need to. But uh, I mean, also the history is there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's almost naive for a lot of people lie to themselves and sort of pretend that we're in a post-racist society or that the royal family are above it, which is ridiculous like we've all seen those pictures which are incredibly difficult to even look at and never mind defend of prince uh william and philip back in the day being carried by it was a specific tribe of i, I can't remember whether, whether they were caribbean or um mm -hmm. sort of the other side of the world but but, but they were these black tribalish um, looking men, and for some reason, I believe it was something to do with World War II, Prince Philip. Oh, right. basically up around Prince Philip, but they pandered to it and they go and they carried on chairs. And like, right, you know, after I think, especially for somebody like Megan, who herself has well, she's black, one of her parents, she identifies as black, one of the one of her parents is white, but how is she, she must have had that thought. How am I going to explain to my black child the, these pictures of this family that we're meant to be told to have pride in? Like, yeah. like, like what the fuck? What, what, what's that about? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that specific story, I mean, um, I'm a bit rusty in the details, but it's, 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 I believe it's, it's an island somewhere in near Vanuatu, which is the Pacific. And yeah, yeah they have this, some sort of accident of history relating to who knows what, uh, but that the people on this island believe that Prince Philip um, was God. <laughs> and yeah, yeah they had a, a portrait of him and for whatever reason believed that he was God and uh, worshipped him. And yes, you're right. He didn't really sort of, he kind of embraced it or kind of maybe they didn't, you know, deal with it with sort of kind of the seriousness that they should have or or maybe, you know, shouldn't have pandered to it perhaps. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to bring up this thing here about the actual, you know, ethnic minorities stuff that that came up. Um, I mean, it's, it's very clear. This is this is the Guardian. So, the Queen Court is banned coloured immigrants or foreigners from serving in clerical roles and role in the royal household until at least the late 1960s. So we're talking about uh, what is that? Seven, at least uh, perhaps 17 years into her rule, um, there was a ban on coloured immigrants or foreigners. Um, yeah. There's a whole bunch of stuff, actually. So talking about the other thing that I wanted to bring up from The Guardian was, you know, the Queen is always portrayed as not interfering in politics, not uh, taking a role and not making any decisions and not influencing anything and whatever. Um, and that's always been the big argument that, oh, no, no, she's not really the Queen. She's just, you know, she's just a figurehead. She's just, she's just that lovely lady. Um, but sadly, that's not true. No. Uh, take a look here. One thing that they do sort of lean on that is, it's obviously, through history, people who aren't British and don't know, we had what's referred to as the Glorious Revolution, uh, the Parliamentary yes. Revolution, where basically we, we killed a king, became a republic for, for a hot moment-ish, but then brought a king back. And part of that condition was that we Parliament would forever curb the power of. But that rule was quickly eroded and more and more the, the monarchs did interfere with parliament using soft power suggestion that if, if Tories and originally Tory what is now the conservative that ideology sprang from uh, the cavaliers the people who were there to protect the king they were the, the opponents of the roundheads this is an ideology of monarchism so mm -hmm. having a monarchist party dominate British politics as they have since they were the opposition of the Whigs and now the opposition of the Labour Party um, in government. How can you, you these are the representatives of, of the royal. You can't say, oh, the royals aren't yeah. influencing politics. It's all, well, they completely influence 
one of the biggest political mm. parties, the oldest now political party in the world. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. So it's yeah, I mean, to even think that those two things aren't aren't connected. Yeah, I know we're yeah. going to talk uh, about it shortly. But when we were with the thing with Andrew, when Boris Johnson was asked about his opinion of Andrew, his answer was the royal family is beyond reproach. So well, that says it all. As far as these people who are in power, the largest political party in in the UK, believe the royals can do what they want. The, the laws don't apply to them, and that is scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, there's other the other side to it is then that a lot of the wider royal family, the the bigger, the, the longer tentacles of the firm, um, do, yeah, you're talking about people that are in either associations, whether it's uh, financial groups or uh, actual members of 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 the Conservative Party or lords. Um, they do stretch further. So yes, you might say, oh, the the Queen doesn't do make decrees um, and doesn't interfere, but well, okay, well. But the relationship between this yeah. aristocratic class and uh, the bourgeois class is very much intertwined. But in fact, though, I, we, I do have to sort of go into this article that we've got here, where this idea of them just being um, soft power, as you say, or influencing stuff, is yeah. also not yeah. even accurate. That there's a lot of far more direct, blatant, um, obviously behind doors, but blatant. No, you can't do this. We don't want that. This doesn't apply to us. So um, if you look here, royals vetted more than 1,000 laws via Queen's consent. So um, more than 1,000 laws have been vetted by the Queen or Prince Charles through a secretive procedure before they were approved by the UK's elected members of Parliament, the Guardians established. Um, so the huge number of laws subject to royal vetting cover matters ranging from justice, social security, pensions, race relations, and food policy through to obscure rules on car parking charges and hovercraft. Don't know why that one's there, but... Um, this one, though, the, this, what's that? Hello? Yep, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry, don't freeze it. Yeah, no, I, I don't know what, what the thing about hovercrafts is, but it also goes into, as you'd expect, uh, they included draft laws that affected the Queen's personal property, such as her private estates in Balmoral and Sandringham, and potentially anything deemed to affect her personally. So you've got a person, a very rich person, who gets to see the laws on their own property and earnings, etc., and gets to influence and also, uh, yeah, preview them. But also, you'll see later. There's also veto. They did. They have vetoed stuff. Um, but yeah, but it, it literally affects everything. You got the European Union stuff in here. You got file safety, agricultural stuff, um, and all sorts. So the idea that they don't have a role is is very much undermined. So if actually, I'll jump to the next one um, over here. Where you can see they vetoed, where they actually vetoed certain documents, certain um, laws. So just double check and see that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So veto over bills. Okay. So what did they veto? Uh, Thirty-nine bills have been subject to the most senior royals' little-known power to consent or block new laws, um, and also reveal the power has been used to torpedo proposed legislation relating to decisions about the country going to war. So this one's actually slightly positive, um, this second line here, because apparently um, the Queen stopped some bill that would have allowed Parliament to strike Iraq um, independently, sort of without her, her approval, um, back in 1999. So here, uh, in one instance, the Queen completely vetoed the military actions against Iraq bill in 1999, a private member's bill that sought to transfer the power to authorize military strikes against Iraq from the monarch to parliament. Okay, so sure, uh, a nice, you could say maybe positive thing, but of course she didn't do anything against the actual yeah, you know, invasion. Yeah, if, if she had to, if she wanted the rubber stamp, she did end up using that rubber stamp, which she did, she gave parliament permission to go to war then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you can argue that Iraq was over. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, we can't read the entire document, but basically uh, it shows that royals are playing an active role in the democratic process and we need greater transparency in Parliament so we can be fully appraised of whether these powers of influence and veto are really appropriate at any stage. This could come up and surprise us and we could find the Parliament in less, is less powerful than we thought it was. So yeah, uh, yeah, th there's loads of things, particularly about wealth and the transfer of wealth as well as stuff that affects their land and whether they can drive on their estates and all sorts of other weird stuff that they do veto and play like a big role on stopping or uh, whatever. 
Um, so th it's a lie. It's a lie, this idea that they yeah. don't play a role in, in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think because there's so little information is in the public sort of consciousness um, about the royals and their duty. And a lot, a lot of it is just the uh, sort of the common knowledge that is most of the time not true. Like you ask the average Joe about a swan and they will tell you with confidence their fact that they've got prepared to go, did you know that every swan in the country is actually owned by the queen? <laughs> so it's like Frankie Boyle joker that the, I imagine the queen just running around her estate with a baseball bat beating swans to death going, I'm the only person who can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I, I still thought that was true. I don't know, wait, 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 I'm just sorry that everyone has always said the queen owns all it's true, but it's something that everybody believes right, in some right, right 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 that's what you mean yes 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 yeah <laughs> um yeah I, I think that i mean i i feel want to talk about um a, uh, andrew because uh, it was quite quite a shocking uh thing i mean we'll talk about andrew but they also talk about the more historical and serious stuff that happened mm -hmm. underneath her rule as well i mean but just for the sake of breaking the pr when the, the when the machine failed when the pr machine broke and uh, you know the curtain was raised a bit, and and we saw some 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 bad stuff. We saw some bad PR. So this is um, Edward. We uh, pointed out beforehand that Andrew's team advised against this. He actually went against the grain. He said, "No, I need to do this. This is a good idea." They said, "This isn't gonna. This is gonna end in tears," and he ignored them. Mm -hmm. Of course, it did end in tears right, right. <laughs> for him. So if you don't know, um, Prince Andrew who is apparently the Queen's favourite son, or was the Queen's favourite son, uh, was hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein, the guy who, you know, was doing sort of trafficking young girls and sex parties and all sorts of terrible, terrible things. And this was an interview that was then done um, of Andrew, and he's trying to answer where and why and how uh, there's allegations that he would have been um, hanging out and having sexual relations with a 17 year old girl. So this is what he said in this interview. And it's pretty, well, I'll see what you, your, you can make your own opinion on this one. One, one of Epstein's accusers, accusers, Virginia Roberts, Roberts yeah. has made allegations against you. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating <laughs> and that she went on to have bath, there's a, there's possibly. A, there's a slight problem with, 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 with the sweating um, because, uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was, oh, actually, yes, I didn't sweat at the time, because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at, uh, and I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. Do you remember dancing at Tramp? No, that couldn't have happened because the date that is being suggested, I was at home with the children. You know that you were at home with the children. Mm. Was it a memorable night? On that particular day that, that, that um, uh, we now understand is the date, which is the 10th of March, uh, I was at home. Uh, I was with the children. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking for a party at a, I suppose, sort of four or five in the afternoon. Why would you remember that so specifically? Why would you remember a, a Pizza Express birthday and being at home? Because going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. I've never been, I've only been through Woking a couple of times um, and I remember it weirdly distinctly. As soon as somebody reminded me of it, I went, oh yes, I remember that. It's just there that I don't think you pick up on. But when she's asking him a question and he's answering verbally, yes, and he's shaking his head, and he's like, You realize you're saying no right now with your head. <laughs> Quite involuntary. Like a Freudian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> body I mean, so we've already picked that apart. <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, I feel like there's two things I want to say about that thing. One is the ham fisted attempt to shove his war record in there. Like, yeah. I can't sweat uh, because um, I, I had uh, I, I, I exposed to so much adrenaline during the mm. Falklands War when I served. 
Right. Um, hero. Valiantly for my country. <laughs> I don't sweat because I'm a war hero. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second part is just, you know, we watched earlier. The people have spoken and picked their sovereign and the people's princess and the, the, all of this stuff. And then you've got a, a man, her son, um, who says, well, the reason I can remember this Thursday from many years ago is because I went to a pizza express and that is not something I do. So what a brilliant way to sound completely unrelated and un, yeah. uh, un, un, unfamiliar with like ordinary people yeah. <laughs> to show like how, how bizarre and how different this class of people is. Yeah. How they literally just don't share anything in common with us at all. Yeah. Going to a pizza restaurant. I mean, also pizza express is not like a lot of men. Years ago. Of, you know, quite, quite just, a, oh, on that date, which we now know is that date. You mean that date where nothing happened? How can you, how did you even determine it was that date if nothing happened on that date? Like, yeah. It could have been any date if it, nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on a side note, I want to express that Pizza Express is not just like, you know, it's not like a, a, a it's not, it's it's a, I would say, medium, medium to top pizza restaurant. It's not, you're not talking about the the, the worst type of pizza shop, just to, <laughs> just in case anyone doesn't know what Pizza Express yeah. is. But yeah, um, but yeah, it, it bizarre, a terrible interview and a moment when the PR like collapsed. You, you yes, had a, a huge embarrassment. And yes, I believe there's, actually, film, being fun. I believe there's hmm? actually a film in production at the moment of this interview. In oh, the spirit man. of, I don't know if you ever saw that film. Um, Snow. Frost Nixon. Yes, Frost Nixon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. This is worthy enough to make a film out of, of a car crash interview. Obviously, this is the Absolutely. career. This is what ruined his career. What we've just yeah. essentially watched. And yeah. This yeah. is why he's so, not like, got allowed to wear a uniform today at his brother's ascension, and obviously why Charles is king and he has been given the Queen's corgis. Of course, being given the corgis is a perfect job for him, since he is a, a groomer. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wait, <laughs> very good, very good. Very good. Um, oh, a side note. Uh, apparently, also, the Queen has invented her own breed of dog. It's mm. called the Dorgie. Uh, a dash hunt mixed with a corgi. Um, uh, but it's not, it's not been recognized by any official body. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, in, in classic royal style, uh, it's a, basically a form of incest, or because it was her sister's dogs and her dogs, you know, and a bit of bit of interfamily mixing to to create yeah. a new breed of a super royal dog. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, we well, we should probably talk about the stuff that happened under her reign. So, yeah, the queen chooses to be the sovereign and stand for the state. Uh, is the head of the state. So what I mean, we can't go into all of the history of the British Empire after 1953 until 2022. But I think what would be interesting to read is some of the stuff that Africans have been saying um, now that she's died regarding the uh, the relationship with 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 uh, yeah with the Queen yeah. and with the Empire. Um, so there's a really good one from uh, first. Let's look at this one here. This is from the New York Times, which just goes over some stuff, some of the things that were said. So. So bear in mind, when she gets the news of her dad dying in 52, she's in Kenya. She's on um, a royal engagement, her first sort of solo royal engagement. She went because her dad was sick. Her dad dies and she's in Kenya. So bear in mind that this is a picture of what was happening in Kenya in 1952. So you've got Mama fighters uh, detained. Uh, this, of course, was a colony. These guys were anti-colonial um, rebels who were trying to overthrow the colonial authority, and they're in concentration camps. That's a yes. concentration camp. Um, and she was there. She saw that. She knew that was going on. That was happening under her government um, a few days as she, you know, when she took power. But there's loads of horrible stories here. You're talking about um, castration, uh, thousands of people in in camps uh i mean i try to find this stuff here sorry uh but yeah i mean a, a completely horrible horrible situation uh here we go torture rape castration and killing of tens of thousands of people and bear in mind this is from the new york times which i, I doubt is a uh, the most hard hitting when it comes to this i don't think they want to dig as and cut as deep as, as maybe someone else might uh, which we yeah. can read now yeah. the the economic freedom fighters statement um 
But I did like this this statement here from one of the young Kenyans. So this is a young Kenyan lawyer, a 34-year-old, uh, Alice M Mugo um, from Kenya. She says, you can look at the monarchy from the point of view of high tea and nice outfits and charity, but there's also the ugly side. And for you to ignore the ugly side is dishonest. Completely. Hmm. I think that's a great way to summarize it. And I'll just jump onto the uh, economic freedom fighters because I don't think I can do justice of a good uh, no. No. reply. And I think they can. So here we go. This is from the economic freedom fighters in South Africa. Um, this is their statement on the death of, of Lizzie. So they say the economic freedom fighters notes the death of Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor, the queen of the United Kingdom and the ceremonial head of state of several countries that were colonized by the United Kingdom. Elizabeth ascended to the throne in 1952, reigning for 70 years as a head of an institution built up, sustained, and living off a brutal legacy of dehumanization of millions of people across the world. We do not mourn the death of Elizabeth because to us her death is a reminder of a very tragic period in this country and Africa's history. Britain, under the leadership of the royal family, took over control of this territory that would become South Africa in 1795 from Batavian control and took permanent control of the territory in 1806. From that moment onwards, Native people of this land have never known peace, nor have they ever enjoyed the fruits of their riches of this land, riches which were and still are utilized for the enrichment of the British royal family and those who look like them. From 1811, when Sir John Craddock declared war against Amatrosa in the Suerfeld in what is now known as the Eastern Cape, up until 1906, when the British crushed the Bambata Rebellion, our interaction with Britain under the leadership of the British royal family has been one of pain and suffering of death and dispossession and of dehumanization of African people. We remember how Tele died in the aftermath of the fifth frontier war, how King Itza was killed like a dog on the 11th of May, 19, uh, of 11th of May, 1835 during the sixth frontier war and had his body mutilated and his head taken to Britain as a trophy. It was also the British Royal family that sanctioned the actions of Cecil John Rhodes who plundered this country, Zimbabwe and Zambia. It was the British, royal family that benefited from the brutal mutilation of people of Kenya, whose valiant resistance to British colonialism invited vile responses from Britain. In Kenya, Britain built concentration camps and suppressed with such inhumane brutality the Mau Mau Rebellion, killing Dedan Kimati on the 18th of February 1957, while Elizabeth was already queen. This family plundered India via the East India Company. It took over control and oppressed the people of the Caribbean islands. Their thirst for riches led to the famine that caused millions of people to die in Bengal, and their racism led to the genocide of Aboriginal people in Australia. Elizabeth Windsor, during her lifetime, never acknowledged these crimes that Britain and her family in particular perpetrated across the world. In fact, she was a proud flag bearer of these atrocities because during her reign, when the people of Yemen rose to protest against British colonialism in 1963, Elizabeth ordered a brutal suppression of that uprising. During her 70-year reign as a queen, she never once acknowledged the atrocities that her family inflicted on native people that Britain invaded across the world. She willingly benefited from the wealth that was attained from the exploitation and murder of millions of people across the world. The British royal family stands on the shoulders of millions of slaves who were shipped away from the continent to serve the interests of racist white capital accumulation, at the center of which lies the British royal family. If there is really like life and justice after death, May Elizabeth and her ancestors get what they deserve. Pretty hard hitting stuff. Oh, sorry. Oh, did you drop out there? That's fine. Did you catch all that, Chris? I, I caught the majority of it. I think I lost out during uh, a king was killed by killed like a dog. Well, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it was a. It's pretty much, I'd say, one of the best summaries of the points you need to know. In relation to the royal family's role historically and also even under her reign that mention of yemen uh, the mention of kenya again the mama um yes yeah as as the lawyer said earlier the the tea parties and what sure if you want to focus on that but it's not honest it's not a real reflection of of who they are and what they have done and what they've come from no and that's what's really jarring that you we can point to so many places throughout the world and mm -hmm. find statements so similar to this and stories so similar to this throughout India and Pakistan and, and Burma and Bangladesh you'd get so many stories of people who are split from their land under the direction of the British Empire and really mm -hmm. the only people who speak the opposite of that are really unfortunately the people who were lucky enough to be born directly on this sovereign land 
if you were lucky enough to be born here and lucky enough to be born in a very specific time and situation, you might have been impervious to some of the nasty reactions. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. there's a Churchill quote that that sort of explains us that the wealth of the West is built uh, on the graves of the East. We live comfortably because they didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And any of the comforts that we do have in the West were brought about uh, through struggle against these people in this class. Yeah. Um, these people were not necessarily on our side of history. No. Uh, necessarily quite, quite very much against most of the progress and things that we do enjoy um, in different parts of the world. Yeah. But things that, even things in this country that we do, that we enjoy, that we class as a credit to this government or to this establishment, things like the NHS, were actually mm. born, given to us as a token gesture to stop us rebelling like. The rebellions that we were putting down in Greece after World War II. Yeah. It was yeah. at a time when our revolutionary movement was at its highest. It was a case of we need to give them something to calm them down or they'll kill us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. 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 Um, yeah, to placate us, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, to placate us. Uh, I, I guess this is one of those ones where we, 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 we can agree with the Americans because. Uh, you know the the royal family is something that they have overthrown and yes. they live at least in a in some form of republic um yeah <laughs> yeah um a, a country that is an imperialist country with an anti-imperialist past which is i think a lot of british people always find it quite jarring when they're here for the, usually for the first time america's relationship to for instance, a group like the ira because obviously Americans have got a very different opinion of the IRA than what the British would imagine they'd do. But the majority, yeah. obviously America have got a huge Irish uh, population and they see mm -hmm. a lot of themselves in the IRA. Mm -hmm. like a group that have fought to, to unshackle themselves from British rule. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I, th I think... I think yeah, uh, so 100%. 100%. The Americans were, were, were part of a, a, a large part of sponsoring the peace treaty, weren't they? The Good Friday Agreement. Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is this is one of those things where, in uh, in between imperialist nations, there's there is that contra there is this contradiction. Yeah. Uh, and the Americans have have got sort of this uh, historical antagonism towards the royal family and towards the, the you know the monarchy uh, and the yeah. system that they did overthrow. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. Yeah. They did uh, underwrite all. I think. I'm not quite sure the, sure the exact term, but yes, they played that important role in the signing of the, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, guarantors, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'm sure to think I do have uh, another video I wanted to show of the Queen's first ever uh, broadcast. It's at, when she's a child, almost, or uh, well, she's very young, I believe, yeah. Um, yeah. talking about the early experiences of the war. Um, I, I think it is obviously you know, again, soft power, it's how she wants to be portrayed. So I'll put that one up. Uh, and then I don't know if we can have some final thoughts to close on. Unless you want to talk about something else, Chris, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, well, well so to this video, what I really want to sort of talk about is the future, really. Mm, 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 well, mm. Let's have a look at this video. Mm. Okay, well, actually, Joe, why, why don't we close on it? We'll let that one be the last word and we can just okay. hear the Queen. The last broadcast can be her, her first broadcast, so yeah. we'll, at, least on this, on, at least on this channel. So go ahead. The future, yeah, the future is a very interesting one uh, about so, where where this is all going. For uh, since with the Queen being so old, it's like uh, to me I, the kind of person that I always use is you know when you get an elastic band ball and you don't want to throw it away until you've seen how big you can actually get it. That was what the Queen was for me. Like uh, she got to a certain age where it was like, well, we can't really get rid of it. Well, let's just let her die. And for as a Republican in this country, I thought we were being incredibly, incredibly polite, not really campaigning too hard while she was alive. But we always said the minute she's dead, oh, it, the, the game's over. We're going out full swinging. Now we should mm -hmm. be having that discussion as loud and as public as we, we can. This is an undemocratic institution. It doesn't belong in the 21st century. We should be now having that discussion to become a republic. Already, when you look at these polls, that the, like ITV did one during the Jubilee last year, 
Um, Twenty-nine percent of the population said that they wanted to be a, become a republic, and that's without even anyone campaigning. They've come to that conclusion on right. their own. Imagine what that would be with a decade or two of campaigning. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, it wouldn't take that long. But if you look at, say, an issue like Scottish independence, the, yeah. how quickly those numbers changed throughout uh, the SNP's oh, yeah. power. With yeah. a good campaign behind us, and this isn't a popular king. The popularity was with the queen. It's not that they love the institution. It's they had an affinity for this dear old lady, with sweet voice yeah. and nice dogs. Yeah, that's yeah. what they liked. They liked the public relations side of it. Yeah. They felt yeah. for that. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's people like the PR and the the nice face. They don't yeah. if they think about the institution and think about the undemocratic relationship and the fact that they do veto stuff and they all of the money and. And then, of course, there's the, the the bizarre actual characteristics of what these people actually Scandals. how they live. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what people actually like. People like the facade of the royal family if they like it. Uh, they like the parties and the weddings and and the fa- the fairy tale. Um, yeah. But if you actually start talking to them about, well, do you think that a really rich person should sit in and have a private meeting um, with our leader, and and poor people can't have that same representative sit there permanently? Um, you know, is that, is that how we should have it? Should there be a permanent seat, unelected, of this royal family? You, you, if you, someone said that to you, that's that's not democratic. It's not. It's, yeah. it's really not. But yeah, you, you're absolutely right, though. Just 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 while you're um, while you're speaking there, it seems in terms of the public Republican movement, sorry, um, and Republican meaning anti monarchy, not Republican as in American Republican. Yeah. Um, King Charles is a different kettle of fish. So apparently, this is now the moment, and I agree. I mean. It did feel like because of how long she'd been around, she'd been there since the 60s. And everyone's mind, you know, the Queen has always been there. Too, too much to to try and push the, the boat there uh, on the yeah. Republican. But now that she's gone and you've got um, Elizabeth uh, gone, sorry, they've got Charles and then I suppose William and then I guess George after that. So and also now we've entered the stage where there will be one every roughly 20 years because of the, the age difference and whatnot. Um, yeah. you know, Charlie's at best, got twenty years. Uh, is a man, you know, a ninety-three-year-old yeah. man, not as common as a ninety-three-year-old woman. Um, so yeah. it's now w- within the realm of possibility that we then we, we could possibly have two kings this decade. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. If he got very sick in the next five years, absolutely. Yeah, before before twenty thirty, that's very possible. I mean, he would be he would be nearly uh, he would be over eighty uh, yeah. or, or close to eighty. Is very easy. I mean, uh, yeah, we've had kings die in their seventies. Many, yeah. many kings die in their seventies. Many, many men die in their seventies. Um, yeah, but so apparently the Republicans are saying that that, that there is a, a big opportunity now. So, I mean, yeah. I'm trying to see if I find a poll right now, but I can't see a poll that stands out to me yet. But I do think that that movement is going to get momentum now. It uh, usually lands around at the moment. It's usually lands around a third of the population. Okay, a pro-Republican. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Well, but that's so obviously. That's- that's, that yeah, that's, yeah, and that's also thirty percent. While the monarchy has its strongest uh, representative, um, yeah, a twenty, a seventy-year-old monarch, a seventy, a seventy-year reigning monarch, um, who's always managed to try and stay out of the mud. Uh, so yeah, that's that's at its best. It's thirty percent. Um, well, sorry, at its worst, Republican, but yeah, at its best yeah. support. Yeah. But yeah, mm. I thought it was quite telling as well. I watched uh, BBC uh, coverage of uh, when. Just I think the morning when she died, and it was mm. Liz Truss had just gave a speech in Parliament of uh, the energy crisis, and the BBC presenter said, "Given what's just happened this morning um, regarding the Queen, the energy crisis now seems in, seems in, in, insignificant." And the guy who said it to me said, "Maybe overshadowed was that that was a Freudian slip on that guy's behalf." Like, and that but that's exactly how they're going to think now. They're going to say, "Well." The rabble being cold for the winter and having blackouts, that doesn't matter because Her Majesty's dead. Right, that, right, 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 right. Unless you're going to give yeah. us a limb each to burn to keep warm over the winter, it does matter. Like, well, for the I mean, average person, the fact that they can't pay the NG bill, that is what matters, not... <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I think that's that excellent point, Chris. Um, the cost of living crisis uh, is obviously what is going to bothering people all over. But now that we're going into a cost of living crisis and people are going to start... Um, having to, you know, cut back and not consume as much and cut on the energy bill. Interesting observation I, I, I made. Um, yes. When the Queen came into power in 52, um, the country was on rationing back then. 
Um, sugar and meat, you were only allowed whatever, 220 grams of sugar and X amount of meat per week. So people were on rationing back then when <laughs> the queen came to power. And now that she's gone, uh, we're going back to, you know, rationing energy and whatever yeah. costs that you have to cut, whatever corners you have to cut in your living. So maybe, maybe she was the magic that kept away the scarcity. Of <laughs> so you haven't seen what I actually thought you were going to say. You, you made a, a very good point uh, the other day on social media, which I hoped you were going to say then. Um, hmm. so it's about, about Scotland. And yes. Okay. Well, we can talk about this too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. I thought you said that I don't want to sound like a conspiracy, but I don't think you, I thought you sounded spot on. So just repeat what you said, please. So. Right, right, right. So, so, so um, when this happened, uh, the first thing I came to my mind, it, it was following, well, basically the queen dies in Scotland. And um, in that week you had Boris Johnson fly up to Balmoral, fly back, uh, Liz Truss fly up, fly back, both of them in the space of something like 48 hours. I think it might've even been the same day, um, which in the cost of living crisis looks very bad, you know, and the climate crisis too. You've got polit uh, literally two politicians making four plane trips uh, you know, together uh, over, a, over what is an administrative um, act. You know, Your Majesty, I am now the Prime Minister. Your Majesty, I'm resigning from Prime Minister. Okay, yes, you know, that, it literally a completely symbolic act. I thought that's bizarre. What, why is she there? Obviously, she was sick now that we know. But um, the, the decision, I think, it, it just seems too uh, politically convenient the, the fruit is so big that yeah. the queen yeah. dying in Scotland. Like moving the seat of power. Dissuade, yeah, dissuade Scottish nationalism. So it yeah. shows that the queen dies in Scotland. Scotland's a part of us, you know. So you can use, again, these are people that are masters of PR, are thinking about everything and how it looks and how it sounds. Aesthetics. And have definitely given hours of thought to where the queen will die and have yeah. gone, yeah. if she dies in Scotland, she can... Um, you know, she can add to that national cohesion of Scotland and Britain and the British Union. And come on, stay with us. And obviously, the, the reason that my initial thought for that was also because David Bowie, when he was dying, uh, used his political capital, if you want to call it that, to say, uh, Scotland, stay with us at the British Awards or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, so that, that was why I thought that is because it's, it's it seems that dying people with influence do seem to exert some sort of um, attempts in politics and, and to, to sort of throw their last uh, lot in. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I can't prove this that that that, that she died there uh, purely by a choice. So she did love Balmoral, blah blah blah. But it just seems like a very, very, very politically convenient thing to happen. Yeah, with everything that we know about about the firm and how organised its PR is, nothing is done by accident. Uh, so I completely believe that they knew she was dying. Sorry, mm. they knew she was ill. Mm. It, it feels to me the decision to move her to a what is it at this point a disputed territory <laughs> <laughs> it just seems too perfect doesn't it the fact that it caused someone like nicola sturgeon to have to go on tv and say the words the scottish people love her majesty i was like oh i could feel a little bit of throw up in your mouth as she said that. <laughs> right 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 no uh, yeah i i do think it was uh, it was if it was an accident i mean it's just the luckiest accident it's so so convenient yeah, um, but I, I think the optics of it, yeah, it, yeah, I, th I think it was, that's my, my guess, my speculation. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, should we end with uh, Her Queen's, Her Majesty's, sorry, her first broadcast? I'll go and find yeah. it for you one second. Um, oh. It's so, so basically, yeah, this is her speaking with, I believe it's her sister, um, and it's a message to other children of uh, the empire, no, uh, other children of, um, you know, of, of Britain who are, being sent away. So I'll just play it for you and then we will close off a moment. Second. Just got to skip to the ads. Okay. All right, here we go. Her weeks, weeks of practice, practice to, to remain, remain calm, calm and composed. All of us children who are still at home think continually of our friends and relations who have gone overseas, who have traveled thousands of miles to find a wartime home 
and a kindly welcome in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the United States of America. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. Well, there you go. The Queen's first message and her <laughs> last release of this stream. All right, so we'll catch you next week. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. And uh, please, also, we have our podcast up. And if you do enjoy this, please like, share, subscribe, notifications, bell, and comments if you want to put in comments any suggestions of future stuff we can do too, uh, future videos. We were going to be doing the Chilean constitution today, but the Queen uh, compelled us to, uh, you know, not to do that. So perhaps we'll do that next week, but we'll see what happens in the week. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Right. Thank you very much, Rich. I'll see you next week. Great. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.